Acha, so we were talking about uh, the shapes of molecule last time. And uh, we did, uh, so we were talking about shapes of molecules. We did all sorts of shapes. Uh, uh, if, if you had five bonds, if you had one bond or two bonds or, or it was tetrahedral. So we did all of these shapes. Uh, now what we are going to try and do is we're going to try and learn about uh, the, remember these are all covalent molecules. So we're going to talk about intermolecular forces now. And uh, and how do those intermolecular forces arise? So if you have different molecules, they are going to attract each other. So so we're going to talk about uh, we'll be talking about intermolecular forces. Now the first thing is uh, the first thing is what is an intermolecular force? So you have a you have these molecules now. Uh, we've realized that they bond with each other. The bonds are really strong. For example, you've got a carbon dioxide molecule, so it's it's got it's got a pretty strong bond. Uh, a double bond here and a double bond on this side, and then there's another carbon dioxide molecule and another one. Now these molecules, uh, they're not going to attract each other very strongly. There would be, there would be hardly any force of attraction between them. That's known as a very weak intermolecular forces force. Uh, so there's a very weak intermolecular force that exists. Between these molecules. So carbon dioxide molecules are gases. And the reason they're gases, they've got low melting and boiling points. So these molecules are just flying around uh, randomly. No one is stopping anyone. So uh, because they're not they're not uh, attracting uh, or attracted to each other. So so if this molecule wants to go in this direction, uh, the other molecules are not going to stop it. Uh, they're not going to attract it that strongly. So they have very weak intermolecular force. Uh, but then you've got molecules that have kind of slightly stronger intermolecular forces. For example, I've got an iodine molecule. Now, even though, remember the intermolecular force uh, has nothing to do with the bond. The bonds could be very strong or the bonds could be very weak. For example, in the case of iodine, the bond is not that strong. Now, in the case of iodine, what happens is iodine at room temperature is a solid. That means it also has intermolecular forces, but the intermolecular forces are kind of uh, kind of really strong. So if you have these three iodine molecules, the intermolecular forces are going to pull them together. Okay, so the force of attraction between these molecules, that's kind of strong. So the intermolecular forces are going to uh, pull them close to each other and they would eventually form a lattice. So all the iodine molecules would be kind of sticking to each other. So I can have more iodine molecules and they're all kind of uh, sticking to each other. Just a second, let me. So just like this, so all these iodine molecules are kind of sticking to each other because uh, the force of attraction or the intermolecular force that exists between them, that's kind of really strong. So all the molecules are tightly holding each other and they're all kind of forming a lattice. This lattice is not going to be very strong because at the end of the day, the intermolecular forces are weak. Uh, it's just a relative comparison. Sometimes they're really weak. Sometimes uh, they're kind of strong. So, so this one, uh is gas gaseous this other one has kind of uh strong intermolecular forces so that's that's solid so so intermolecular forces in this case are just relatively stronger so just very slightly stronger intermolecular forces in this particular case. So remember the strengths of the intermolecular forces are not always the same, they, they vary, they kind of vary from molecule to molecule. Uh, is this clear? Anna, is this clear, Alicia, Mariam, Rabab, is this clear? Yes. Okay, so, uh, 
so we're going to talk about the nature of these intermolecular forces. Uh, now, the intermolecular forces, there are three types of intermolecular forces. Uh, and we will study three, those three types. The first one is called, uh, we'll start with permanent dipoles. That's uh, That is the, uh, that is number one. Number two is going to be known as hydrogen bonding or hydrogen bonds. And the third one is going to be called uh, uh, Van der Waals forces. It's got other names as well. It's got, uh, it's, it's also called temporary dipole induced dipole. Uh, sometimes also known as dispersion forces. So it's got it's got different names, but they're all the same. Uh, the strongest one out of the three, uh, that is, uh, if the size of the molecule is the same, Uh, so the strongest one is uh, is your hydrogen bonds. Those are the strongest. So that's your hydrogen bonds, and the uh, weakest one those are going to be your Van der Waals forces. Uh, but that depends if the size is the same. Uh, so we, at the moment, we're not sure what these forces are. Uh, but I've given you an idea that uh, that if the size of the molecule is the same, then the strongest out of the three is hydrogen bonds, and uh, the weakest one is Van der Waals forces. Remember, size is an issue when it comes to intermolecular forces. So we'll discuss that later. So I'm, we're going to start with the first one, and that's permanent dipoles. Number one, when do molecules have permanent So it's a permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction. Interaction. I said now, uh, when does a permanent dipole happen? Uh, it depends on two things. It depends on one thing is that uh, there has to be an electronegativity difference. Uh, between the atoms in a bond. And that difference should result in the formation, uh, which results in the formation of So it, it results in formation of a dipole, which I'm just going to discuss. But the important point is, is that there has to be a difference in the electronegativity of the, of the atoms. The second point is uh, the shape of the molecule. The shape of the molecule is important uh, dipoles should not cancel out. So I'm going to talk about that also in detail. So our dipoles, they should not cancel out. Uh, so the first thing, electronegativity. Uh, earlier we had learned previously that uh, when you move to the right, uh, if I open the pure table, to figure out which elements are electronegative and which ones are not electronegative. So, so uh, so for example, this might be a, th this might be a good three dimensional representation, just a second.
Okay, let's take this one. So here we have a pure table and uh, if you look at this pure table, uh, remember electron negativity, the tendency for an atom to gain a shared pair of electrons. Like when an atom sees electrons, uh, the tendency for the atom increases to the right. Uh, it increases to the right. You've got more electronegative elements on the right side, which you kind of also know that the ones on the right side, they tend, they have this ability to gain electrons. Uh, uh, the ones on the left, they don't like to gain electrons. They like to lose electrons instead. So you've got more electronegative elements on the right side. And electronegativity also increases uh, upwards. That when you have, uh, when you have an electronegative, uh, the, the ones smaller atoms are more electronegative. So that's also, True. And the reason is the elements in the corner, they've got more protons. The two factors, DK, we did talk about why an atom would attract electrons. The atom would attract electrons very strongly if it's smaller, which means there's going to be less shielding. The electron would be very close to the nucleus, right? And the other reason is uh, that it, it has more nuclear charge or it has more protons. So the smallest atoms, they lie on the right side and they have the mo they have more protons as well. Like lithium only has three protons, but in the row, right on the right side, uh, there is uh, fluorine, which has, uh, which has a lot of protons compared to lithium. So the tendency for the atom to gain electrons kind of increases. So these are the, these are kind of the most electronegative elements uh, uh, that you're going to, uh, the ones on the right corner. And there's a gradual trend. These ones like to lose electrons. These ones, they like to gain electrons. DK, is this point clear? DK, Zari, is this clear? Rabab, Nabila, Mariam, is this clear? Yes, sir. So, so yeah. when you... Yes, any question? I said, now, uh, when you have two atoms together, you've got an H atom, and they're sharing an electron. There's a bond between them. Uh, there are two electrons being shared. And there's a Cl atom. So they're bonded to each other. So these two atoms are bonded to each other. And they're sharing electrons, one each. If you open the pure table, you'll notice that H is uh, less electronegative. Uh, I think the value and Cl is right on the right side. So it's more electronegative. So what's going to happen is that the electrons are not going to be equally shared one of the atom has a stronger attraction for electrons compared to the other one. So, I mean, both atoms, they're trying to gain electrons. They're trying, they're fighting over these electrons, but one of the atoms has a slightly greater pull. Uh, so the electrons would be kind of, kind of very slightly closer to Cl, which would result in the formation of a, of a dipole, which means that if the electrons are slightly closer to Cl and Cl has a greater tendency, if you look at Cl over here, it's got a greater tendency to attract electrons. So that indicates that Cl is going to have a slightly negative charge and there's going to be a slight positive charge on this side. TK, is this point clear? Yes. So, so the electrons, the molecule, the electrons are not going, it's not going to be a perfectly covalent molecule. It's going to be, uh, the electrons would be slightly closer to Cl. So that's known as a, that's known as a polar molecule. And that's known as a molecule having a dipole. A polar molecule always has a permanent dipole. And this is a permanent dipole. That Cl would always be having a slight negative charge. So it depends. Uh, stronger dipoles are going to be produced if the difference in electronegativity is uh, is large. Like if if the elements don't have any electronegativity difference. For example, as a for example, if you look closely, you would notice that nitrogen and Cl they almost have. I mean, they have exactly the same electronegativity. I mean, you don't have to learn the values, but but look at nitrogen seal. They have uh, exactly the same electronegativity. Uh, and the other elements as well that have almost the same. Uh, what if they are the same element? Like, uh, 
Like if you have a Cl atom and there's another Cl atom and the electrons are being shared in the middle. Now this time, both Cl atoms have exactly the same, uh, the nucleus has the same, same number of protons. They have exactly the same pull. So this electron would be trying to pull the electrons over here. This electron would also be, this Cl atom would also be trying to pull the electrons over here. The end result would be that the electrons would stay right in the middle uh, because both Cl atoms are att attracting the electrons with equal force. So the forces kind of cancel out. So in this case, uh, it's not going to be a polar molecule. It's going to be a non-polar molecule. Yes. Could you please um, just recap what you did earlier than this? Because my mom, her phone was out of charge, so I couldn't. Um, one, one, one second. Uh, just, a, just a quick brief recap, right? I was talking about, uh, I mean, we, last time we had done shapes of molecules, etc. We did questions on that. I said, we started talking about uh, intermolecular forces. I told you that uh, you've got different molecules, right? Like carbon dioxide, all of them are sharing electrons. Uh, so the molecules, uh, they attract each other, but sometimes they attract each other with very weak intermolecular forces. So uh, uh, there's, they're all flying around there in gaseous state. Sometimes you have molecules and the attractive forces between them, it's kind of stronger. And uh, they're holding on to each other. For example, the iodine molecule that's solid at room temperature. So, so the intermolecular forces would be relatively stronger. So I told you that there are three types of intermolecular forces. One of them is permanent dipoles. The other one is hydrogen bonds. The third one is Van der Waals forces. And I explained that the hydrogen bonds are the strongest and the Van der Waals forces are the weakest if, if the size of the molecule is the same. As anyways, we started talking about permanent dipoles. That's the first one. So I, in permanent dipole, permanent dipole, this is what we're talking about. Uh, I talked about electronegativity. I talked about the fact that when you move to the right side of the periodic table, the elements, they tend to sort of gain electrons. They have a stronger attraction for electrons. We did, when we were talking about ionization energies, it was ha always harder to remove electrons from the elements that are on the right side because they've got more protons. And the elements on, on the top of the periodic table are also more electronegative. So uh, because they're smaller, a smaller atom, the electrons would be very close to the nucleus. So there would be more attraction. Anya, is this clear, this thing? Yes, sir. Okay, so these ones are the ones that have this strong tendency to gain electrons. This corner one, the fluorine is one of the most electronegative elements. Actually, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, all three are kind of considered to be the one of the most electronegative elements. So anyways, you uh, a dipole is going to be formed when you have an electronegativity difference. What that means is, like if you have a covalent molecules, why do they share electrons? They share electrons because both atoms are trying to pull electrons, right? I mean, this H over here is trying to pull electrons. The Cl is also trying to pull electrons. So the electrons are kind of stuck in the middle. They're stuck right in the middle, uh, which is why they end up sharing electrons. But uh, if the attraction for electrons is, I mean, if one of the atom has a stronger attraction for electrons, like Cl is more electronegative. So the electrons would be kind of closer to Cl, just slightly closer to Cl. So it's going to have a slight negative charge. The other one would have a slight positive charge. Honey, is this clear? Yes, sir. And that results in a polar molecule. Uh, that's known as a permanent dipole. It's like this side would be positive. This side would be slightly negative. Uh, sometimes there's not going to be any difference at all in the electronegativity. That results in a non-polar molecule. Uh, I mean, if you have both Cl atoms, they, they both pull the electrons with equal force. So the electrons stay right in the middle. So you like a tug of war, the electrons would stay right in the middle and the forces of attraction would cancel out. So it's going to be completely non-polar. The electrons are right in the middle. Uh, no one is gaining those electrons or slightly gaining those electrons. So the, there's not going to be any permanent dipole. So you is this clear? Honey, is this clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. As a, and then similarly, uh, sometimes what's going to happen is that there's going to be a huge difference in electronegativity. For example, Na and Cl, let's assume that they started sharing electrons, right? Na is right over here. Na has a very low electronegativity. 
ठीक है इफ यू लुक एट द वैल्यू इट्स पॉइंट नाइन एंड सी एल इज राइट ऑन दर साइड थ्री ऑलमोस्ट थ्री टाइम्स मोर इलेक्ट्रोनेगेटिव सो समाइम्स वेन यू हैव अज डिफरेंस इन इलेक्ट्रोनेगेटिविटी वट हैपन्स इज दट इलेक्ट्रॉन्स कंप्लीटली अगेन्ड बाय सी एल and that would result in a full positive ion na would completely lose the electrons and cl would completely gain those electrons and that would result in an ionic bond and that would result in the formation of ions so remember it's a spectrum uh like if there's a huge difference in electronegativity then one of the atom completely ends up gaining those electrons If you just have a very slight difference in electronegativity, then one of the atom just slightly gains those electrons. It gets a slight negative charge, and sometimes there's absolutely not going to be an electronegativity difference. So the electrons would stay right in the middle. So they would be. So it's a spectrum. Uh, you've got ionic compounds, you've got uh, polar molecules, and then you've got non-polar molecules. Is this clear? ठीक है बाकी uh you've got uh, you've got covalent molecules which have permanent dipoles or polar covalent molecules so they have a slight difference in electronegativity and the last one is that you have completely non polar covalent molecules where the electron sharing is almost perfect so there would be no difference in electronegativity Uh, so intermolecular forces would exist over here in ionic ionic compounds there is no electronegative uh, there's no intermolecular force because that ends up forming a giant structure in ionic compound you end up uh, with a lattice it's uh, it's going to be your it's going to be your ionic lattice because ions are formed the electrons are completely gained by one of the atoms so it's going to be a huge structure and every negative ion would be attracted to a positive ion which would be attracted to a negative ion so that's going to be a big giant structure and uh, without any intermolecular forces uh, it's going to be one big structure with just ionic bonds so only these forces these polar covalent molecules or non polar covalent molecules have intermolecular forces so we're going to start discussing uh, the first one which is permanent dipole i told you that uh, i had an hcl molecule and so there's a very slight unlike unlike ionic compound it only has a very slight partial negative charge the other one just has a very slight partial positive charge so there's going to be an hcl molecule another one so this would be partial positive this one would be partial negative so if i draw three hcl molecules each one having this very slight dipole so the negative part of the cl will be attracted to the positive h the positive h will be attracted to the negative part of the cl of the other molecule and so on so there's going to be these attractive forces these would be known as permanent dipole permanent dipole interactions because one permanent dipole would be attracting the permanent dipole of the other molecule is this clear everyone yes sir yes sir theek hai so you have a permanent dipole Nee, Abdullah, you will not be given in electronegativity values. I mean, like the values that are shown over here. Uh, but you should be able to uh, guess what the trend is. Uh, you should be able to guess uh, 
what's happening. When you move to the right, the electronegativity increases. So this, this top corner over here, these are the most electronegative elements. And as you go further away from this, the electronegativity decreases. So this corner is the most electronegative corner. That's uh, that's the most electronegative. And this corner over here is the least electronegative. And also remember one thing that when you move diagonally, the electronegativities are kind of similar. For example, uh, if you look at these values, if you look at oxygen and chlorine, uh, and let me draw the diagonal thing uh, one second. So when you move diagonally, the values are kind of, uh, I mean, they would be kind of similar. I mean, this diagonal, for example, you have, if you look at sodium and you look at calcium and you look at these three. So diagonally, the values are kind of uh, uh, very similar. So also remember this, uh, on this diagonal, you've got similar electronegativity. Is this clear? Okay, but when you... Yes, yes sir. But remember, and remember this, okay, you might get a question on this. They might ask you, uh, which element has a similar electronegativity compared to calcium? So you wouldn't have values with you. So you, you should know that uh, around this diagonal, the electronegativities are very similar. The other diagonal, if you're moving from this corner to the other corner, the electronegativity constantly increases. Because when you move to the right, the atoms and to the top, the atoms become smaller and they've got more protons. So there's going to be more attraction for electrons. Actually, anyway, so we uh, so that's what a permanent dipole is. Uh, a lot of molecules will have permanent dipoles. Uh, but remember, permanent dipoles... Achai, is this clear? Permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction. Yes, sir. Uh, an extreme version of this is an ionic bond. Like if Cl was able to gain those electrons completely, then the Cl would have a negative charge and the H would have a positive charge. The other H would be positive. This one would be negative. So it would end up forming a lattice. Uh, but in this case, it's just a very slight negative charge. Uh, also remember permanent dipoles uh, depend on shape of the molecule. So I'm just going to write PD for permanent dipoles. Uh, so a lot of times what would happen is that the permanent dipole will cancel out. It's, it's very much dependent on the shape of the molecule. Uh, one example is if you look at carbon dioxide, can anyone quickly tell me which one is more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? Like which one is on the on, t, t, oxygen is on the right side. I said then you have to look at the shape of the molecule. Like if you if a molecule has two bonds, two bonds only. Like there's a pair of bonds over here. There's a pair of bonds over here. So they would re repel each other. So the angle would be exactly 180 degrees. The molecule would look exactly the way I've drawn it. It's just going to be a straight line. One oxygen on the right side, one oxygen on the left side. Anyway, so oxygen is more electronegative. So oxygen will try and pull those electrons. But there's another oxygen on the other side that is doing exactly the opposite. It's also more electronegative. So it's going to try and drag all those electrons to this side. What would happen? Because they're both oxygens and they both are pulling the electrons with an equal force. The electrons will stay in wherever they are because the forces of attraction will get canceled out. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Is this clear? My name is this clear? Anna? Yes, sir. So, so you've got all sorts of shapes. Uh, for example, you, you might have a fan shaped molecule. If you have three bonds like AL, CL3. Uh, now, CL is very electronegative, but in the case of AL and CL3, if you have three bonds, the molecule is going to have a trigonal planar shape. So the angles would be uh, 120 degrees. So just like a fan, the CL would be trying to pull the electrons. Uh, but there are three CLs and they would all be pulling electrons in different directions. 
And again, uh, one of the CL is pulling electrons upwards. The other one is trying to pull the electrons on this side. The third one is trying to pull electrons on the right bottom over here. Eventually, the three forces, th th think of this as three people trying to pull on something and the three are pulling things in different directions. Uh, the electrons would stay wherever they are. They're not going to move anywhere. So again, the dipoles are going to get cancelled out and it's going to be a non-polar molecule. It's not going to have a dipole. Uh, similarly, uh, let's do another one. Uh, if I have a CCL4 molecule, you've got... Now, if you have four bonds, the molecule is going to have a tetrahedral. It's going to have a tetrahedral shape, which we did draw. Uh, the tetrahedral shape was... Uh, we did draw the shape somewhere. One second. This one. So if there are four CLs, again, the dipoles will cancel out. There's a CL that's pulling upwards. There's a CL that's pulling electrons towards the back, one on the front, one on the side. So again, uh, the dipoles are going to get canceled out. So even, where did it go? Just a second. So again, in this case, your dipoles, dipoles are canceling out. So dipoles cancel out. So it's not going to have any dipoles. Uh, can somebody tell me if I have a molecule that has uh, this shape? You've got N bonded to fluorine. Now N has a lone pair. So the shape is kind of tetrahedral, except uh, that uh, on the fourth side, there is nothing there. TK. So this is... I mean, there's no atom over here, so you don't count that as a shape. It's just a pyramid now uh, with the top missing. Okay, so the top bond over here, that's missing. And the angles kind of shrink a bit. Uh, that the angles, because of the lone pair repulsion, the lone pairs have a stronger repulsion. So the angles, instead of being 109.5, they become 107. I said, but anyways, uh, do you think that uh, dipoles are going to can get cancelled out? Like there's a fluorine that's pulling electrons over here. There's a fluorine that's pulling electrons over here and the fluorine that's pulling electrons over here. And the nitrogen is sitting at the top of the pyramid. And imagine three fluorines at the bottom of the pyramid they are trying to pull the electrons downwards. So is the dipole going to cancel out or is it not going to cancel out? Kia ora, anyone? Anna, any idea? Zaheb, Bayim? Well, it won't cancel out. So it's not, it's not going to cancel out because uh, both atoms, all three are si sort of hanging on to nitrogen and trying to pull the electrons uh, in the downward direction. So the net force would be that the electrons would be kind of, would be would be pulled downwards. And the N over here would, might ha would probably, result, that would result in a slightly positive charge at the top. So this molecule is going to develop a dipole. Uh, unlike this one, this will not have any dipole. So everything depends on shape. Uh, if the shape is right, uh, I mean, if sulfur trioxide is this thing. Oxygen is more electronegative, so it's fan-shaped, but the dipoles cancel out and it's going to be non-polar. But you've got SO2, which is kind of the same except that there's no oxygen on the on the other side except that sulfur has a lone pair that that is present now in this case again both oxygens are trying to pull the electrons downwards so the net result would be that the electrons would kind of get pulled downwards in the downward direction so this side would be negative this side would be po negative partial negative and this side would be partial positive uh, so is this clear Yes, sir. Yes. So remember, you have to remember the shapes uh, and the strength of dipoles. Uh, the strength of dipoles is simple that 
greater the electronegativity difference, stronger would be the dipole. So greater electronegativity difference and that will result in a stronger dipole. Uh, for example, uh, we can start with F and CL. Uh, there could be uh, what's next to F? That's uh, uh, oxygen bonded to Cl. Again, there might be another bond. Uh, you've got nitrogen bonded to Cl. And there might be, I'm just ignoring the other three bonds. And there might be C bonded to Cl. Again, whatever, let's ignore, just focus on this bond. Which one out of the three is going to have the strongest dipole out of the four? Which two atoms have the greatest difference in electronegativity? And I'll have the uh, one is F and CL. Let's start with C and CL. You have the PR table over here. So C is here and CL. The further they are from each other, the greater the difference in electronegativity. Is this clear? Yes. And the difference in electronegativity constantly decreases. Like N and CL, that's the difference is almost non-existent now. Uh, it's almost the same. Uh, so the greater the difference in the electronegativity, the greater would be the dipole. So that is one very important thing. I said, so I'm, I'm going to do some questions. Uh, can you tell me if this molecule, which one out of the three molecules would be the most polar? Like I have, uh, okay, let's, let's take two molecules. Again, remember shape is also important. So this one is fan shaped. So I've got another molecule. And the hint is, uh, let's talk about the electronegativity, uh, oxygen and Cl, right? Oxygen is 3.5, Cl is 3. And uh, H is 2.1. Okay, so I'm just going to quote those values to figure out oxygen is the most electronegative in all these cases. So oxygen is 3.5, Cl is 3. And you've got uh, oxygen over here, which is 3.5, and H is 2.1 and 2.1. So which one do you think will have almost no dipole and the dipole would get canceled out? I mean, which one is going to have a dipole? Konsul Abdullah, any idea, Anya? I mean, all three atoms are trying to pull electrons in different directions. Anyone, Anna, any idea? I said you should take it first. Won't. Abdullah, did you get this? Yeah. I said the first one, all three are kind of almost pulling the electrons with the same strength. So that means the electrons are not going to go anywhere. The electrons for of carbon would stay at stay wherever they are. I mean, this oxygen is pulling over here. This CL is pulling over here. This CL is pulling over here. So it's like three people pulling in different directions. So the forces of attraction are going to get canceled out and the electrons would stay wherever they are. In this case, the hydrogens are pulling the electron, but with a weaker force. Oxygen is pulling the electrons very strongly. The H atoms are not pulling the electrons with enough strength. So the electrons are going to get dragged towards the top, just very slightly. So the electrons would kind of, the electrons in this bond over here, or the electrons that are around this, all the bonded electrons would be slightly pulled towards this oxygen. And the hydrogen atoms would slightly lose those electrons because there's just going to be a slight uh, attraction. The electrons would kind of shift upwards very, very slightly. Is this clear? 
Yes, so remember, you you won't have these values. You'll just have to estimate whether the element is electronegative or not, depending on how much on the right side and on the top side it is. So you won't have these values. So so remember about permanent dipoles, a few things that it depends on the difference in electronegativity, that the electronegativity difference should be there in the bond, plus the shape of the molecule, that the molecule shape should be such that the force of attraction, they don't cancel out. Like in try in the middle shapes are uh, the force of attraction they they don't uh, cancel out because all three atoms are trying to pull electrons downwards uh, similarly in trigonal planar shapes the forces will cancel out if the electron negativity is almost the same uh, so it's it's think of it as physics as vectors in physics uh, if the electrons are getting pulled in one direction with a lot more strength uh, than the dipoles will exist. Similarly, in tetrahedral shape, like you've got a Cl, you've got H, and you've got another H. Now, the H atoms are not that electronegative, and you must have an idea like H. Remember always, whenever you think of H, you think of H plus for nine, right? So that means H has a habit of losing electrons. So it's not that electronegative. Cl, whenever you think of Cl, you think of it as minus one, which means that Cl has this strong affinity or tendency to gain electrons. So in this case, Cl would be very strongly pulling the electrons. DH at the bottom uh, will have very weak attraction for electrons. So the electrons would kind of get pulled towards the top. The Cl would have a slight negative charge and the H atoms at the bottom would have a slight positive charge. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anna, is this clear? Mariam, Anya, is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the other two forces uh, then in the next class then. Take care. everyone, uh, take care. Allah Thank you, sir. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Uh, just one second, I'm sending the board link.